So I am Adiba and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. So before we begin, uh, I would like to share a few housekeeping announcements. Okay, firstly, uh, please keep your microphones muted during this presentation to minimize background noise. And secondly, uh, for the MMA CPD points claim, uh, please kindly take note that uh, you have to fill in the attendance and feedback form, uh, which the link will be posted in the chat box later from time to time. And last but least, if you have any question, you may drop your question in the chat box or you may ask the question directly um, during our Q&A session later. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I would like to invite our speaker for today's webinar session, uh, Dr. Laila Tulhaziah Muhammad Pauzi, uh, who is a hematologist at Hospital Chancellor Tuan Kumu Chris. And today, uh, Dr. Laila Tulhaziah will be uh, sharing with us a very interesting uh, topic on navigating a rare lymphoma in the elderly. So please welcome uh, Dr. Laila. Okay, assalamualaikum and good morning, everyone. Let me just share my slide. Boleh nampak ke slide saya? Okay, boleh. Boleh, boleh nampak. Okay. Uh -uh. Okay, saya start eh, Diva. Okay, boleh, boleh. Okay. Alright, so Assalamualaikum and a very good morning everyone. My name is Dr. Laila. I am from the Department of Diagnostic Service of HUKM. Uh, thank you for the East Coast to Find webinar team for inviting me to give this talk today. Today I will talk about a, rare, a case of a rare lymphoma in the elderly. Okay. Gerak tak saya punya slide? Saya nampak first page lagi lah, okay? Gerak. Okay. Uh, case presentation eh, Dr. Adiba? That slide betul ke? Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Case presentation. Alright, All right. so I will start with my case. My case is uh, a case of an 82-year-old Chinese lady with underlying hypertension. Prior to presentation to the hospital, this lady was ADL independent. So quite a well lady, just hypertension. She presented to us with high fever, shortness of breath, left iliac fossa pain for one week, with a history of, of cough for one month, associated with loss of appetite and loss of weight. So constitutional symptoms with otherwise quite non-specific symptoms. So on examination, we saw a pale lady with full GCS. She had bilateral periorbital ecchymosis and bruises over bilateral dorsum of hands. She had no hepatosplenomegaly. Initial investigation, FBC shows pancytopenia. The HB was 8.3. There is leukopenia at 3.4 with mild um, neutropenia and platelet of 99. And FBP shows leukoerythroplastic picture. No abnormal lymphoid cell or blast cell seen. So at this point, the clinical team had a few differential diagnoses, which includes um, pneumonia, TB, and because of the pancytopenia and high fever, they were also suspecting HLH. Okay, so they sent further investigation to rule out this possible working diagnosis. So what we saw was the very high LDH, 2000 plus, and sky high ferritin at 33,000. right was mildly increased. The LFT was normal apart from the AST, which was markedly raised. RP was normal, electrolytes, including calcium, to rule out autoimmune ANA, rheumatoid factor, and complementary were all normal. They sent sputum for AFB, which also turns out to be negative. Viral screening, including HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C, was also negative. And SUEP sent uh, serum urine electrophoresis, 
surprisingly gave a positive monoclonal protein, IgG kappa, with a quantitation of 120 milligram per deciliter. Okay. So next, they sent a bone marrow aspirate to us with the aim, oh sorry, imaging was done. Ultrasound abnormal shows no abnormality. However, CTTAP shows multiple and large lymph nodes at the paraaortic region, lumbar region, and mediastinal region. So note the patient had enlarged lymph nodes both uh, above and below the diaphragm at this point, and some of them were matted. Because of the location of the lymph node, they were very close to the um, vital organs, uh, and the lady was frail. They didn't attempt to do a lymph node biopsy. Instead, they sent a bone marrow aspirate to us to rule out one HLH and also two to look out for evidence of lymphoma uh, in lymphomatous infiltration. <clears throat> because the biochemical investigation was suggestive of HLH and SUAP was positive and there were lymphadenopathy on CTTAP. So this was the bone marrow aspirate that we received. Remember the uh, lady was 82 years old, so the fragment is markedly hypercellular for the age and we had a hemodilated cell trail. And lo and behold, of course, we found evidence of HLH. We saw many of these histiocytes and macrophage. For example, this one, we, this is a histiocyte ingesting four granulocytic precursors. In this one, the uh, histiocytes is ingesting a granulocytic precursor, some erythroid and possibly some lymphoid cells as well. And this one is a macrophage ingesting multiple nucleated RPC as the same with this one. Other than the very active hemophagocytic activities, we also saw occasional abnormal mononuclear cells, which look like this. They are very large. For comparison, this is our lymphocyte and neutrophil. The nucleus is more than about four times of a normal lymphocyte. They are very large with abundant basophilic cytoplasm. The nuclear outline is a bit irregular and prominent nucleoli but they were only scattered and occasional less than 1% on quantitation cells like this. Next, we examine the trephine biopsy. For an 82-year-old lady, this trephine is markedly hypercellular. So this is a closer look at the trephine biopsy. You could generally see it's bluish and in areas they are a bit pinkish, like this area, this area and this area. So upon closer examination, this, the pinkish area appeared necrotic. And you could see there's almost a clear demarcation of necrotic region and a more viable region. So geographical necrosis was observed. And then let's have a closer look at the cells. The cells, the cells are very pleomorphic. You have large ones, you have smaller and medium sized ones and they have a very bizarre appearance. Some of them have single nucleoli, some of them have, have multiple nucleoli, and some even appear to be binucleated, such as this one. The size is pleomorphic, the nucleus is pleomorphic and very bizarre. So more view of them. Very large with multiple nucleoli, and on the background, you could see some lymphocytes, histiocytes, some erythroid series, like this one and this one, and very little, almost no eosinophils, plasma cell or neutrophils. In. So just lymphocytes, some erythroid and histiocytes. And again, this is to highlight how bizarre they are. Some of them have single nucleoli, multiple nucleoli, and some even appear, appear to be binucleated like this almost Ritz Sternberg like Again, Ritz Sternberg like cells. And another view of them. This is one of the most bizarre morphology that I've seen. So I enjoy looking at the uh, pictures. So I hope it's the same. So it's very bizarre. Multiple nucleoli, single nucleoli, very pleomorphic, and some histiocytes. Another prominent feature that we could see on the background is how um, 
rich it is in histiocytes, these elongated cells, these are our histiocytes, and they are intermingled with our um, bizarre abnormal pleomorphic cell. And this is not surprising given that we've, we saw uh, HLH in the aspirate as well, so we kind of expected to see a lot of histiocytic uh, cells like this as well. So now we have a case of an elderly lady, previously well, um, with large abnormal cell infiltration in the trephine and lymphadenopathy uh, on imaging finding. So the differential diagnosis at this point includes Hodgkin lymphoma because we saw some red stumbled like cell and diffuse large B cell lymphoma or anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So this is our working diagnosis initially. So how do we go about, how do we rule out and determine which of these ones are these abnormal cells? So I took this table from the revised fourth edition of WHO, which outlines what you should think about when you see large red stumbled like uh, or Hodgkin cells. So I have divided this uh, into four main groups. The first one is our nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma and its cousin T cell or histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma. These two entities have similar microscopy and immunophenotyping finding. The second one is classical Hodgkin lymphoma. The third one is DLBCL and the final group is anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Okay, let's look briefly into this four differential. For the first group, they would have a nodular or diffuse infiltration pattern with a background of small lymphocytes. And in the NLPHL, you would see the large bizarre cell or LP cells, we call them. In both cases, this large abnormal cell should preserve their B cell program, meaning they should have CD20 and CD17 and alpha should still be positive and their CD30 and CD15 will be negative. In contrast to classical Hodgkin lymphoma, they would have lost their B cell antigen expression or very weak expression of, for example, uh, PAX5. It'd be very weak and they would be CD15 and CD30 positive. Classically, they would have a lot of background reactive cells, which includes plasma cell, lymphocytes and eosinophils. We don't see very much of them for our case. The next differential you th should think of is our large, D, large diffuse large B cell lymphoma. It has many subtypes and regardless of any subtype they are, they should have B cell antigen expression. And certain subtype can be CD30 positive, but most of them will be CD15 negative. So some will be CD30 positive, but mostly will be 15 negative. And our last differential for large pleomorphic bizarre cell uh, is anaplastic large cell lymphoma. It is characterized by the presence of hallmark cell. They are large pleomorphic with kidney shaped nucleus. So could the large cell be this hallmark cell? Because uh, they are T cell lymphoma, ALCL is a type of T cell lymphoma, they should express T antigens. In small number of cases, they might lose the pan T cell marker of CD3, but most cases will be CD5 positive, and they also have a strong CD30. So try to keep this in mind as we go through our IHC next. So we start with B cell marker. We send for two B cell markers, CD20 and CD79 alpha, and our large cells to turn out to be positive for the B cell marker. I particularly like CD20 because it is a membrane uh, marker and it clearly highlights the outline so you could see how large they are as compared to your normal um, lymphocytes. They are really large and really pleomorphic. Some of them are not that large, like this ones over here, but most of them are very, very large. And 79 alpha shows they express B, B cell antigen. Next, we do T cell antigen. We also send for two markers, CD3 and CD5. And both CD3 and CD5 only highlights the background cell, the scattered reactive T cells. Meanwhile, our big large cells are negative for T cell markers. So now we know it's a B cell. Next, we did CD30 and CD15. 
because this could also different, uh, rule out or rule in what could be the diagnosis. CD15 is negative for the large cell and our large cell express CD30. So let's go back to our differential. So if it, if it is NL, PHL or T cell rich large B cell lymphoma, they should preserve B cell program. We have 20 and 79 alpha, but CD15 and 30 should be negative. So it is not this one. Next, could this be classical Hodgkin lymphoma? Unlikely, because classical Hodgkin lymphoma would have lost B cell antigen expression, or at least it would be weakened. Ours have strong CD20 and CD39, uh, 79 alpha. And our CD15 was also negative. So unlikely classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Is this ALCL? Also unlikely, because ALCL should express T cell antigen whereas our CD3 and CD5 were both negative. So it's looking more and more like we have a case of DLBCL, but we have CD30 positivity. Okay. So some subtype of DLBCL can in fact express CD30. These subtypes include the anaplastic DLBCL, mediastinal type of DLBCL, and also EBV DLBCL. So let's have a further look. What could this be? So as with any case of the LBCL, what you should do next is to molecularly classify them. So determine whether this is a GCB or non-GCB subtype. So we send this tree marker. Our is negative and our mum one is positive, making this a non-GCB type of the LBCL. Next, we send Eber H. We were very lucky in our center, we have Eber H and CD30, we know can be positive in EBVD LBCL. And it turns out to be positive. On closer look, the large cells are the ones that are positive for Eber H. So our final diagnosis for this case is HLH secondary to EBVD LBCL. Okay, let's discuss some important learning points from this case. The first thing I want to talk about a little bit is on HLH. This is a rare life threatening syndrome that occurs secondary to severe systemic in immune activation. It can affect patients of all ages as inherited disease where they would present in childhood, or it could be secondary HLH as in our case. It could be secondary to conditions like hematological malignancy or to immune disease or immunosuppression. So in our case, it is HLH secondary to hematological malignancy. So just briefly on the diagnostic criteria, it was first published in 2004, HLH 2004 it is called, but this uh, is largely catered to the uh, pediatric population. In 2016, another classification diagnostic criteria was uh, validated, but this was mainly used in the setting of uh, a systemic Ju systematic juvenile idiopathic arthritis because they saw in this type of patient they often present with macrophage activation syndrome so this uh, classification or scoring system was uh, created more recently in 2022 a scoring system called the H-Core is validated for adult population to diagnose HLH so it, it takes into account all these criteria like fever, organomegaly, cytopenia, TG function, And it is, um, it is said to be able to sensitively and specifically predict HLH if a patient score more than 200, 235, and it is unlikely to be HLH if the score is less than 150. And in our case, our patient score 235, more than 230 is suggestive of HLH. So this patient indeed had fulfilled the diagnosis, the scoring system for HLH uh, diagnosis. Next, I would like to briefly talk about HLH morphology in a bone marrow aspirate. In 2018, a paper written by E. Gars et al. clearly analyzed uh, about 70 cases of possible HLH and came up with the optimal cutoff value of the threshold um, that could predict HLH, the threshold of how many 
um, hematopoietic cell ingested by the macrophage to accurately predict um, HLH. So this is what your normal histiocyte should look like. Normally, they, they do ingest um, your um, blood cells, but it should only be your red blood cell or at most a single nucleated red blood cell. If they are ingesting more than one RBC and um, more than two nucleated RBC, this is very suggestive of HLH. So this is these are the threshold. If RBC, the threshold is four, and RBC two, granulocyte one, lymphocyte one, and a total of six. Anything more than this is highly suggestive of HLH. So we saw our patient just now had multiple and RBC multiple granulocyte and lymphocyte in a single uh, macrophage, which is highly suggestive of HLH. Okay. Next, let's talk about DLBCL. So how do you classify DLBCL? You could classify it in various ways. The first one being classifying it according to their morphological variants. The most common one being the centroblastic DLBCL. And the next commonest one is immunoblastic TLBCL. Most cases will be centroblastic, in which more than 90% are centroblasts, which have multiple peripherally located nucleoli. And some cases is uh, immunoblastic DLBCL, where they have more than 90% immunoblasts. However, classifying them according to morphological variant does not give much for prognostication. It doesn't mean anything. A more important uh, typing mechanism is probably the molecular subtyping. You subtype them into GCP or ABC, like we did for our case. So you send for CD10 and BCL6. If it's positive, send for mammine. You could then classify them into GCP or ABC subtype. It is important because ABC subtype tends to uh, fare worse than the GCB counterparts. And if you remember, our case is an ABC subtype. Negative CD10, BCL6 negative, and MAMM positive. And particularly for our case, because of the CD3 positivity and pleomorphism, we rule out EBV. age uh, in the eighth decade and commonly seen in patients above 50 years old. But as more case report emerges, it, it has also been seen in patients less than 50 years old. So WHO renamed it to ABV positive DLBCL. They dropped the elderly. As I mentioned before, it is very rare, less than 5% of DLBCL and um, less than 5% the LBCL with no predisposing immune deficiency condition like our patient. They often have greater extranodal involvement. For example, our patient have to find involvement. And the GIT tract, skin, bone marrow being the most commonly afflicted region. Why is it important to diagnose ABV positive the LBCL? Because it is very important for prognostication. We will talk more about this later. Morphology-wise, the neoplastic component most often consists of a variable number of large transformed cells, immunoblasts, and Hodgkin or red stumbled light cell, like what we saw. They have a variable component of reactive elements on the background. They could have minimal to quite significant amount of reactive element. Characteristic finding, they often have a large area of geographical but this may not always be present.
be done is to send for EBH. This is mandatory, mandatory for the diagnosis for EBV positive TLPCL. And you would see with EBH, uh, the atypical cell, most of them will stain positively for the EBH. So I've mentioned before, it is important to diagnose this entity because of their very bad prognosis. Traditionally, for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, they are staged using the IPI scoring system, which takes into account their age, their LDH, ECOG performance, clinical staging, and extranodal disease. And then, uh, according to the risk factor present, they could give you an estimation of progression, uh, free survival, or overall survival. However, a large-scale study in Japan have shown that for EBV DLBCL, IPI doesn't work. IPI scoring system is not optimal to predict their survival. Instead, they come up with a new prognostic mod model for EBV DLBCL using only two variables, which is age and presence of B symptoms. And if you have no uh, risk factor present, median overall survival can be up to close to five years. And if you have more than, if you have both risk factor present, median overall survival is only nine months. As we've seen in our patient, patient was 82 years old and presented with B symptoms, so very bad overall survival. So what happened to our patient? After our diagnosis, the patient was started on rituximab and prednisolone. However, one month later, she was admitted with fever and hypotension, treated as septic shock secondary to HAP. She deteriorated and succumbed to death um, in February. And the cause of death was registered as multi-organ failure with underlying EBV positive DLBCL. So the take home messages from my um, sharing today is the HLH criteria, the differential diagnosis of large cell lymphoma, and this rare entity of EBV DLBCL, and how bad the prognosis is. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Prof Nuraida and Prof Surya Hayati with Prof Shikin for discussing this case with me and also my colleague Dr Priya and Dr Fikri. Thank you very much. That is all from me. Thank you very much Dr Laila for a very interesting case sharing. Okay, um, so um, for the next session, um, uh, so I would like to open for any of the participants who would like to ask question or you want to share uh, your experience. Okay? So you may type your question in the chat box or else you may unmute yourself and ask uh, directly uh, the question. Okay, from the chat box. Um, Dr. Wani, okay, could you share again the HLH criteria? Sorry, speak it again, Dr. Adiba. Okay, a, a question, uh, a comment from the chat box. Okay, the first one, okay, could okay. you share again the, the HLH criteria? Oh, okay, boleh, boleh. From Dr. Wani. So this was a paper in 2018 in Hematologica. So what the team did was they took about uh, 80 patients suspected to be HLH. So they look at the morphological finding and then the final diagnosis is based on clinical uh, scoring system, diagnostic criteria. So this is what they say. Uh, if a macrophage have more than four RBC, or more than two in RBC, even one granulocyte, even one lymphocyte, or a total of more than six uh, nucleated cells in their tummy, it is highly suggestive of HLH with a very high sensitivity and specificity. So they didn't give a cut off of how many of these um, such macrophage you should see, but uh, they observed this uh, uh, they observe it in a hundred, a, a thousand cell. 
So for every 1,000 cell, if you see one macrophage with four RBC, it is considered significant. Every 1,000 cell, if you see one macrophage ingesting more than two an RBC, it is suggested. I hope that answers your question. So like this, this is not abnormal. You could see this in a normal patient even. One RBC is okay. But if it, if it is more than four RBC, then it is suspicious. And macrophage ingesting debris like this is also normal. You could see that in a normal marrow. Okay. Okay. So I think that also answer um, Dr. Aini Anwar questions, right? Mm, how many the cut off? And also another question in the chat box on the significant um, to decide the hemophagocytosis. I think it's already answered. Right. Okay, Dr. Wan Hayati. Yeah, yeah what, what uh, so, um, is in our center, usually I, I, I would report as um, uh, increase or uh, abnormal hemophagocytic activity, activity seen. Mm -hmm. uh, HLH need to be considered because the final diagnosis is still lies with the clinician. So we could just say we saw hemophagocytic activity. But the final diagnosis, the clinician have to incorporate all the biochemical investigation and clinical presentation. That is my opinion. Okay. Um, is there any other question? Or maybe uh, Dr. Faiz or other specialists would like to add some more? Or any uh, 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 experience uh, oh, here. Um, thank you, Dr. Laila. Very interesting case. Um, <clears throat> a few things I want to add on. Um, like if you see uh, a marrow, a tripine with this kind of bizarre, bizarre looking uh, large cells, um, other than thinking of just uh, lymphoma, you need to think of whether it is a uh, poorly differentiated uh, carcinoma. Okay, and uh, but then then it, what we think about uh, carcinoma that cells tends to be in uh, together, but in this case it's all individual cells uh, diffusing diffuse between the cells. So uh, maybe you can throw in uh, pen CK, okay, CK AE one A three just to rule that out. And another thing in centers that uh, do not have able, so we are not that fortunate to have even um uh yes. yet um dr laila <laughs> um, uh, you might just uh stop at um with, with the with all the iacs you have ruled out alcl you have ruled out uh hodgkin lymphoma uh you might just end up with um uh, the rb cell uh the anaplastic type because anaplastic Subtype is CD30 positive and it has a bizarre looking um, cells compared to the usual uh, DLBCL, which, um, how do I say this to my trainee is that in DLBCL, the common DLBCL, um, the cells are large and they are homogeneously pleomorphic. So in this case that we saw, the cells are so bizarre and it's pleomorphic, pleomorphic. Okay. So these are the terms that I've been using to teach my my uh, my my trainees so that we can appreciate um, two things. Eh? One, if the cells look so bizarre, then one of the things uh, that comes to in mind is differential diagnosis is uh, ASL, and uh, another one is polydifferentiated carcinoma. So you need to roll those out. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in uh, the ABCL, the Common, usual, old-fashioned LBCL would be um, large cells. Okay, the nuclear membrane would be uh, slightly irregular, but it's sort of uniformly irregular. Okay, the plomophic plomophic cells are tend to be on the T cell side and also um, either poorly differentiated. So in this case. We have, um, Dr. Laila has ruled out um, ALCL and it turned out it's a B cell. So in centers that do not have able, and you just might, uh, you can just uh, diagnose as anaplastic uh, the LCL. That's what I can think of um, from the discussion. But um, in KKM, of course, you, you have good support and you can send off to uh, other centers to 
to do evil. Uh, I think um, EPO and HKL have evil also in Queen. Okay, how do we assess in a follow-up bone marrow three-point biopsy of this patient? Um, okay, the next, uh, after treatment, if the clinician uh, decided to do uh, repeat bone marrow three-point, so the two things that we need to look at, okay, always when there, when there is a follow-up bone marrow, always, 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 always compare with the diagnostic bone marrow, okay? So you need to see the cellularity, you need to see whether the, those basal cells are still present or not, and those um, uh, HLH in the background, is it still plentiful? Is it a histiocyte? Has it, has it reduced? So what we can, uh, the important thing that when you report a uh, three point is that one of the criteria, the cellularity, you have to give um, roughly the cell to fat ratio. So that when your first diagnosis, in this case, it will be like what? Um, cell to fat ratio will be between uh, 80 to uh, 80 fat, 20, uh, sorry, 80 cells, 20 fat. Okay, between 80 to 90 cells and then uh, 20, uh, 20 to 10 uh, fat. So the next uh, bone marrow, so you, 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 when you see this improvement of the um, marrow cells, so you, you, you report that uh, the cell to fat ratio will be what? About um, 60, 40 maybe. So when the clinician read, read your report, uh, they will say, oh, okay, dulu, 90% more of them are cell, just cell now. Uh, so the fat is coming back and uh, cells now is 60. So they can they can immediately appreciate there is some improvement. Okay. Um, uh, that, do that answer, do I answer your question, Dr. Wan Hayati? And uh, there's always subsequent um, <clears throat> three point in uh, such patients. So unfortunately, this patient passed away uh, from the, uh, the disease itself as well as the treatment. Okay. So take home message from me. Satu, you need to rule out um, that there is a, a but uh, in this, when you see this kind of bizarre looking cells, you need to rule out uh, carcinoma. Okay. And, um, and another one is that uh, when you see a follow-up three point, always compare with the previous one. Okay, make a hassle. Kacari lah kat mana, you always make a hassle so that you can see, you can appreciate the, the first three point and then you can appreciate the, the next three point. How do, I mean, I know the cost of Iber ish, uh, Dr. Laila, maybe you can answer this, but I think roughly about 500. Uh, minta maaf Dr. Wan, saya tak tahu tapi saya can find out for Dr. Wan nanti Dr. Wan boleh drop your number ke email ke nanti saya find out kan my email ada tak kat chat box eh thank you Dr. Laila okay. uh, you, you have to apa ni uh, estimate between 3 to 500 eh? our, our experience uh, antara ke private lab I think about it costs around that 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 uh that price. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much about uh, the carcinoma. I put that the VK, but we should rule out carcinoma juga with that bizarre looking cell. Thank you, Dr. Faiz. Yes, sir. okay, thank Welcome. you very much, Dr. Faiz. Uh, uh, is there any more question? Okay, if there is no more question, uh, before we end this session, um, I would like to remind all the participants again, please kindly fill in the attendance and feedback form, uh, in which the link already posted in the chat box um, to claim your CPD points. Eh? And um, again, I would like to thank our speaker for today's session, Dr. Laila. Uh, for the great case sharing and discussion and also Dr. Faiz for the additional information and if um, to all participants if you do have any interesting case to share uh, during this webinar please do not hesitate to contact us so that we can arrange um, a session for for you to present the case okay and um, so we end our session today
Thank you again. Until we meet again in the next Bone Marrow to Find webinar. Thank you and Assalamualaikum. Thank you everyone.